Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Tammo sadanho suchedoye olahudi sammiyao sanputoshe. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa. By Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu, Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi, Yuan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. How is everybody? Uh, we're here again at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm in Queensland, Australia. My name is Reverend Hung Shur. We are about to look into the, begin the Flower Garland Sutra, the Ten Stages chapter. Uh, once again, it is Sunday, August 23rd here in Queensland, and Saturday, August 22nd in California, or wherever you are. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, that side of the planet, uh, we're a day ahead of you here down under. So um, we're going to look further into the Flower Garland Sutra's description of the Bodhisattva. And last week we were talking about something pretty interesting, uh, pretty controversial as well, psychic power. And there's a standard list of five kinds of spiritual vision and six kinds of psychic power. And it's been a, a topic in, it's been a, top, a topic of fascination in uh, Asian Buddhism for as long as the Dharma, even in the Buddhist time, so 2,500 years. And when we bring this uh, controversial matter to the West, we get, we ruffle a bunch more feathers and shake up a bunch more paradigms and rock the boat and mix the metaphor, uh, talking about people who are like skeptical and downright disbelieving and even aggressively opposed to the notion that anything uh, beyond what my eyes can see and ears can hear should exist or we should admit exists, right? It's grounds for denial of all of that. So, interesting, controversial, right? In other words, let's talk about it. Let's, let's look into it deeply. So, one place to go, if you want to find out about Shantong, about psychic powers, um, is the Flower Garland Sutra, this very sutra that we're looking at. There's a chapter, um, the, a piece of the Ten Stages chapter, the very chapter we're looking at. Uh, that, that goes in in detail, and I've unearthed that. It's from the third ground, Di San Fang Fa, Fa Guang Di, the stage of emitting light. That's where we find it, and I've brought it up, and uh, want to uh, want to look into it with everybody. We did a couple. We did two or three last week, and we got a few more to go. So we're going to make progress into our tenth stage but also refer back to the third stage to explain some of the things happening on the tenth stage. To do all that, we begin with an invocation, and we're going to come back to page, the bottom of page 40 and 41 when we're, when we're back. So let's scoot up to the top of the page. Here is the title of the sutra and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who brought it to us. We're going to chant that in Chinese. It's right there on the page if you'd like to do it with us.
song guitars for making these lovely carbon fiber instruments that are impervious to weather changes. So no matter how dry, no matter how damp it is, the guitar doesn't change its tuning. Sounds great to my ear. Alrighty, back to page 40 and 42. Let's just scroll on down. You can lose your lunch watching this. Scroll on, okay, further, further, further. Too far. Ah, there's got to be a better way, right? There you go, 46, 44, 42, and there we are. Now, let's see here. We've got... We'll start at the top. Um, let me say a word. By the way, here's our... Outdoor Buddha sitting in the Queensland bush, meditating happily. What's going on is we've just begun a series of 10 descriptions of the Bodhisattva's psychic ability, his, what he is able to do. And uh, it's, there's re repetition going on. So we've got 10 series of, a series of ten descriptions of transformations in the world that the Bodhisattva is able to do for reasons and tells why he's able to do that, okay? So, let's jump right in. We, we read the first one last week, but I want to start over again, so we're beginning with Fo zi ci di pu sa zhi hui ming da, shen tong zi zai, we'll start right there. All right, here we go. This is the section. Fozi ci di pu sa zhi hui ming da shen tong zi zai. Sui qi xin nian neng yi xia shi jie zuo guang shi jie. Guang shi jie zuo xia shi jie. Gou shi jie zuo jing shi jie. Jing shi jie zuo gou shi jie. Luan zhu ci ci zhu. 倒住,正住,如是无量一切世界皆能胡作. Slide over, English, here we go. Disciples of the Buddha. The Bodhisattva on this stage has wise understanding and sovereign psychic powers. Should he wish to do so, he can turn confined world systems into expansive world systems and can turn expansive world systems into confined world systems. He can turn defiled world systems into pure world systems and can turn pure world systems into defiled world systems. Whether they are chaotic or orderly, upside down or upright, he can turn limitlessly many world systems into each other. Yeah. So, our Bodhisattva, we've heard about where have we, come, where have we been? If we look we know where we've been, we can figure out where we are and have a clue about where we're going. We've been talking about the Bodhisattva's memory and his memory allows him to hear and retain Buddha teaching, Buddha Dharma, the Buddha's teachings. So with that capacity to remember all of the Dharma 
that he has heard without forgetting any of it, he is now equipped with a very big toolkit. He's got a major medicine bag when he goes out on a house call. This bodhisattva can explain it in a way that you get it. Okay, so here's, here's a, you know, this is so far out, right? So I, I'm in this, this funny place of trying to describe something that I is way beyond my understanding, and yet uh, I know how the bodhisattva are, are exemplar. He's a paragon, right? He's a sample. This is a test case, bodhisattva, of who? Of a person like you, like me, who started out doing what? Well, maybe wanting to become better, wanting to, to learn to meditate, in my case. Frankly, wanting to get enlightened, ah, without having a clue about what that meant, but I wanted it bad. It sounded cool. So, where did you start? That's where I started. And, bit by bit, step by step, along the path, dharma practice by dharma practice, a bad habit dropped by bad habit dropped, by good habit adopted, right? You progressed, we progressed, and we got to a place where things started to change inside. If you had to say what was changing, if you used the Dharma, they say Ru Fa Chu Zuo, Ru Fa Xiu Xing, cultivating according to the Dharma, the process was a gradual transformation of darkness to light. What was the darkness? The darkness was in my mind. It was what covered, this is, what is this? This is Buddhist theory, right? This is our, our theory. This is our principle of cultivation. The idea is that inside each of us, there is a nature that is fully awake, fully lit, and functioning. But what happens is with every, uh, the, the technical term is false thought, every wang xiang, with every attachment that I make, every zhi zhuo that I make, every false thought and attachment in my mind, I cover over what is fundamentally bright and clear and functioning and capable. So, over time, it's a lot of darkness. It's a lot of covering. There's a lot of obstruction on my mind, and I can't see. I can't understand. I don't have wise understanding and sovereign psychic powers. So, what the sutra does, and why we spend so much time looking at it, and why you are so patient letting me talk and talk and talk at you like this, is because the sutra describes the process. It's a handbook. It's a roadmap for uncovering, for lighting up what was covered and dark. That's our theory. So every bit of practice that we do, every bad habit we jettison in favor of a habit that improves our meditation, right, is this process of removing a layer a millimeter, uh, a thin chunk of darkness from what was from from what is fundamentally bright, returning to that light. So darkness yields to the light. That's the theory. Our bodhisattva now has pretty much done it. He's done it. There's not much darkness left in this bodhisattva's mind at all. And so what was fundamentally there is revealed now, and because it says, I, I checked a commentary, I did. Master Hua was a master of the Lun Sang, the commentary, the, the Shastra Pitika, right? The basket of commentaries. And he consulted them in the day and then set them aside. Well, I followed my teacher's example. So all of you speakers of Dharma, all of you who are like me, excited about becoming sacred storytellers, right? 
understand that we, it doesn't start with us. We're the next brick on the road. And so people, men and women in the past, have, done, have looked at the same text and gone, how do I make sense out of this? Let me see what this says. And left a trail. They left a uh, paper trail. They left their, their traces of their traveling. And so the expert, the one you want to check, the one you want to tune into if you're going to attempt to navigate the waters of the Ten Stages chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra, the monk is known as Chengguan Daozhang, right? He is Master Qingliang Guoshi, the national teacher clear and cool, clear and cooling, right? Understanding and refreshing, Qingliang. And he's also known as Master Chengguan, Tang Dynasty monk who was known also as Avatamsaka Bodhisattva. He's the expert. He's the one. He left a commentary, a double commentary, commentary and then a sub-commentary on this chapter. So what did he say about this chunk? Well, I checked it today. And he said, there are four things that our Bodhisattva has now uh, uncovered, discovered, revealed through his cultivation. And those four things allow this, these psychic abilities, these powers to manifest. What are the four things? One is jietuo, liberations. And we talked about those, right? There was a 10 of them that popped up early in our 10th ten sta stage here. And those, uh, those liberations, what, what are they? How do they function? They're essentially a new working of the same old elements that you have, that I have, in our bodies and our minds, but they're functioning in a new way. It's like, um, I use my good old example of, you know, here we go. Here's a guitar string vibrating. Got that? That's a familiar vibration rate in the auditory spectrum. Then you touch it halfway, exactly halfway, and you get this. To go from to this, to go from to this. Called harmonics, right? And it's the same string, but it's touched in a different place, and you get the next octave up and all the overtones and vibrations. So the Bodhisattva has been doing that. And he is now able to transform those elements. They're called liberations. There's, that's a technical term. He's free now of the limitations of physics, gravity the vis visible light spectrum, right? He can now do with it as he chooses. He is free in regard to elements, the elemental makeups, the building blocks of reality. Why? Because he cultivated the Dharma, that's why. Because he was good at meditation, because he became a much kinder-hearted person. Another reason, stopped eating meat. <laughs> Nourished his body with uh, things that didn't require harm to, to, in order to, to feed himself. That's one out of four. What else? Master Chengguan in the, Qing, in the Avatamsaka commentary and sub-commentary, the Su Chao said, samadhis, and oh boy, did we learn about samadhis, uh, that Bodhisattva was able to bring to bear, right? Uh, remember our story of the lotus flower that just expanded and expanded and expanded through samadhi. The third one was what? The, uh, the third one was shantong, this one. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I, in, get a, put them in order. The third one was dharani, dharani, toloni. And dharani came up in the ninth stage. That was the big one. Uh, kind of the theme of the ninth stage, Bodhisattva. Dharani 
we, we would call it vibrations. There are certain sounds. I could pick up my guitar again at the risk of boring you. Um, here's another one. Here we go. What is a, a vibration? Here's a handbell, and this metal is tuned and fired and forged and shaped and a little bit of magic in there so that when you hit it with a piece of metal, it goes like this. And you can hear the vibration, right? If you take the stick, take the metal stick and hit the wood, you get this, right? Nothing, no, no. Hit this, oh, so different. Okay, Durrani's are like that. They are the right vibration to effect reality and change it. So our bodhisattva uses dharani. And then the fourth thing is shantong, psychic abilities. What are they? All four of these have come out of his nature, her nature. They're in you, they're in me, but the difference is now he knows how. He can do it, he's got it, he's got the knack, right? He can do it now. So, liberation, samadhis, dharanis, psychic abilities, psychic powers, are the four things, right? Chi to san mei, tolo ni, shantong. This is what he has now armed himself with, prepared himself with, stocked up on, so that when this bodhisattva launches out into the world to help, he can. He's got all these power tools now, which, with which he is going to transform the world. And we just heard the first one. We just heard the first out of ten. Okay, what does he do? Should he wish to do so? That's, a, that's the sui chi xin nian, right? The bodhisattva is doing this Remember, we had a, uh, back, if you people have been with us for a while, we remember back to the, um, it was the eighth stage, where the Bodhisattva was able to use wu gong yong hang, effortless practice. Practice that took effect without effort. He didn't have to start it, sustain it, stop it, recharge and start again. It was without moving a thought, the Bodhisattva can accomplish so much more than he could with full effort before, effortful practice. So notice the key word here is sui chi xin nian. As he chooses, as he wishes, he can do things that on the face of it sound ridiculous, sound like nonsense. He can turn system, world systems. Okay, world system. Milky Way, right? The Andromeda galaxy, world systems. You can turn a world that is all confined and it's all tiny. You can turn it, make it expand. So, he can turn expansive ones into narrow, confined ones, should he choose to. Then take another set of opposites defiled and pure, he can make them interchange as he chooses. Pure into defiled, he can do it as he chooses. Then it says a bunch of opposites, chaotic luan, or what was the opposite of luan was zhu, right? Abiding, firm. Next was zi zhu, sequential, and then upside down, and then right, right, proper, correct. All of these limitlessly many world systems can be turned into each other. How come? Zi zai shantong, right? Zi, the key word is zi zai in this case. Zi zai means sovereign, you, ch you choose. You are free to do it with it as you please. So, how interesting, right? This is what do we have? Mm, there is a counterpart in the West. Uh, literature, okay? So, what do we have? We have wizards. 
we've got wizards, good ones and bad ones. Gandalf is a wizard from the imagination of J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, right? The Rings trilogy. So we know about Gandalf. Gandalf was really powerful and saved the day in the end. He sent the eagles to pull Frodo and Sam off of Mount Doom in the end, right? That was Gandalf's doing. And who else? Well, we have uh, uh, Alba Stumbledore in the Harry Potter literature from the imagination of, of everybody's favorite magical author, Joanne Rowling, right? J.K. Rowling. So uh, Dumbledore is a good-hearted wizard with a backstory. He's got shadows in his past, but he uh, comes forward and, and uh, fights the darkness, fights off evil. And in so doing, you know, uh, Joanne Rowling takes us into uh, Dumbledore's living space when visit with when Harry Potter goes up to visit and we find out about for example Fox who is Fox Fox is a, a phoenix and he is Dumbledore's familiar he's Dumbledore's pet companion friend and Fox is able to he goes through life cycles he's he will combust and burn, and then a little fox shows up and grows into the big phoenix again. So, uh, and saves Harry several times, you know. And the people, if you haven't read, you know, Harry Potter, well, good stories, right? Tremendous uh, literature for young imaginations. Goodness prevails, kindness prevails. And the power of love is what saves the world ultimately against evil, says, says J.K. Rowling. So, all right. So here is Fox, uh, the phoenix. Dumbledore only has to move his mind and the phoenix goes out and does his bidding. Likewise, you know, now, who came first? Well, here we have a story of somebody, our 10th stage bodhisattva, who is wizard wise, right? Look what he can do. He can, without wu gong yong hang, right? With these effortless practice, effortless abilities, he can flip reality, turn one into another. How about that? Okay, and again, every step of this, right, tests your credulity. You have to go, what? You know, and risk, what do, you, what do we risk by hearing this and nodding our heads? We risk somebody saying, oh, you're a believer, huh? You know, as if being a believer is somehow submissive and inferior to a disbeliever who said, no, nah, I don't believe that. <laughs> so, okay, so, I recall everybody's favorite Tibetan Lama, who will remain unnamed, saying, one must remain skeptical, he says, when faced with challenges to your knowledge. Totally agree. To a certain point, you know, before skepticism turns into cynicism, before it becomes just inherently dark and negative. Skeptical means what? You need to look into it. You want to gather as much information as possible. Um, so that's what we're doing. You know, I am raised in a scientific Western context, and here is the sutra telling me that the bodhisattva can turn an opposite world into an opposite. He can turn... Uh, California into Queensland, right? Turn Queensland into California. Right now, Queensland doesn't want to be California because California is on fire and there's more storms coming this weekend. Um, 
550 forest fires burning in California that weren't burning pre prior to our lightning storms of last week and Omi to four. Yeah. But the Bodhisattva can flip one into the other. How about that? It's like, yeah, yeah. This is wizardry, but we understand that it's wizardry with a purpose. And that purpose is to heal suffering, is to transform affliction, is to end pain, right? And to empower us to be able to deal with it ourselves. It's not that the, we have to wait for the wizard to do it for us, but he's doing it here as needed when he can so that somebody will see it, be impressed, will take one more step on their own into their own nature. And uncovering the darkness will pick up that theory of removing what covers the nature so that we wake up. That's why. These miracles don't exist for 4th of July fireworks. They're not there for a sideshow. They're not there to entertain you while you're in between making money, right? No, nah, it's not. The Bodhisattva, you won't know who this wizard is. He's the guy in the gray cloak. He's the guy with a hoodie in the corner. You won't be able to tell. He won't show off these abilities. In fact, the Buddha made it illegal amid the Sangha, amid his community, to display psychic abilities. Often, as I understand it, when these are being used, you don't know. Just things work out. Things happen seemingly on their own. And the Bodhisattva doesn't want notice, right? But he is a wizard, indeed, able to do these things incredibly powerfully. Okay? Let's look at the next one. This is now, this will be number two. That was our theme. And we hear these opening words nine more times. Huo, huo, sui, xin, nian. He may, according to his own thinking, when the time comes, he might do this. He is able to do this. Or, potentially, as the thoughts move, he, is, he can do this, right? So this is the wizard, okay? Here's the next one, here we go. Huo, sui, xin, nian. Yu Yi Chen Zhong Zhi Yi Shi Jie Xu Mi Lu Dang Yi Qie Shan Chuan Chen Xiang Ru Gu Shi Jie Bu Mie Huo Fu Yu Yi Che Chen I'm sorry, it's all up. Huo Fu Yu Yi Wei Chen Zhi Zhong Zhi Er Zhi San Nai Zhi Bu Ke Shuo Shi Jie Xu Mi Lu Dang Yi Che Shan Chuan Er Bi Wei Chen Ti Xiang Ru Ben Yu Zhong Shi Jie Xi De Ming Xian Very awkward sounding recitation of the sutra. Clunky. Here we go. Or should he wish to do so within a single mode of dust he might place a world system with all its rivers and mountains such as Sumeru and the rest, while its aspect as a mode of dust remains as it was before, and the world system does not decrease in size. Or, within a single mode of dust, he might place two or three, up to and including placing indescribably many world systems, with all their rivers, mountains, such as Sumeru and the rest. Yet, its aspect as a mode of dust remains as it was originally, and the world systems within it are all clearly evident. Okay, so he can take a single mode of dust and then put a world into that mode of dust. What's a world? There's a technical description of a world. A world is, from the Buddha's vision, as he says in the sutra, a sun and a moon, S-U-N, not S-O-N, sun and moon, a Mount Sumeru, which is an upside down triangular shaped mountain, interestingly. It's the polar mountain, the center of the world, and four continents, north, south, east, west, on four sides of Mount Sumeru, and then oceans of fragrant water, it said, Shangshui Hai, surrounded by a 
iron encircling mountain ring. That's a world, right? There we go. So, mountains in a circle, oceans inside the mountains, four continents where living beings live, including us, a Mount Sumeru and a sun and a moon. That's a world system, according to the Buddhist geography, Buddhist cosmology, as described in the sutra by the Buddha's vision. And, you know, okay, don't take it from me, there are generations after generations of men and women who woke up, according to the Buddhist description of it, opened their spiritual vision and said, oh, there it is, there's Mount Sumeru. Uh, mm. You have to ask, right? There it is, it's so evident. Kind of like we with gravity, us, right? What is gravity? Gravity is evident. You drop the capo, 100 times, 100 times it's gonna fall, right? There it is. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. So, it's evident. That's the way the world is built. We don't see it. It's another one of those phenomena that we have to say, keep an open mind about it. As Soon as we wake up, we'll be able to see it for ourselves. So that one we take on faith. You don't have to say you believe it or disbelieve it. Let the Buddha's description stand because he's using that to illustrate what the Bodhisattva can do with his psychic powers. Should he wish to do so, take a tiny mold of dust, dust particle, put a world system in. Here's the sun, here's the moon, here's Mount Sumeru, here's the four continents, here's the ocean, here's the wall, right? And yet, the mold of dust doesn't expand, and the world system doesn't shrink. <laughs> ah! Smoke coming out of here. No way, right? So you can take the biggest and put it in the smallest, and the big doesn't get smaller, and the small doesn't need to get bigger. It stays the same. Got it. Cool. Flower Garland Sutra. Go, go, go. Right? Right. I mean, that really does damage to our concept. It's like, that can't be right, right? Flower Garland Sutra says, you betcha. Sure. That's exactly what he does. Should he choose to do so, Within a single thought, he can do that. With his mind. Or, number two, he can take a single mode of dust and put two world systems, three world systems, indescribably many world systems with all of their suns, moons, Mount Sumeru's, continents, rivers, mountains. And the mode of dust is the same and what was so big doesn't shrink. Okay. This is not an isolated, random, weird description, right? This is called, uh, it's, it's systematized by the commentators into the Shi Xuan Man, the 10 gateways to mystery, or the 10 mysterious gateways, um, such as big and small interpenetrating without obstruction. Da Xiao Yuan Yong Wu Ai, right? And also, what else? Uh, there's also um, time. Well, I'm not going to get ahead. Okay, we'll just work with this one. This is the first one. So big and small interpenetrate. What are they? They're categories. We, with our binary logic, get stuck when we are faced with the sutra telling us this is reality. This is the bodhisattva's reality. He can do this. Because we, like, mm -mm 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 -mm. big and small are opposite. They don't interact, right? Okay, that's the limit of my mind. And we need that limit. Not to say critical. There's no judgment here. Uh, no preference one over the other. It's just saying no limits now. Those kind of limits are bound up mostly with the self and the mind that needs to know. This is a challenge to what? Epistemology. What is our epistemology? How we know stuff. Big and small cannot, you know, up and down, no. Black and white, no. Right? We live in that dual world. But once the bodhisattva gets past the self, the limits of the ego, which he did, she did, on the sixth ground, the sixth stage, 
things change. Things change. Same mind, same bodhisattva, same language system, same, you know, sun and moon in the world and get up in the morning and eat, eat breakfast and drink a cup of tea. Same. Nothing changed there. It's just that now, in the world of the Dharma realm, you can change the factors of reality according to your will in order to help others. Compassion is the motivator for this. And the Bodhisattva takes these abilities as what? Tools. They're tools. They're toolkits. They're bandages and first aid cream and disinfectant and splints and you know pressure bandages in the in the doctor's kit for the bodhisattva that's what these are okay so does that make sense it's that i put i put that context around it because if you were to extract these descriptions on their own people would go bizarre that's nuts or they would go ooh cool i want that Imagine what I could do by putting worlds. I would take the racetrack and put it in my backyard and wait for the horse and, you know. And we, you know, we think of it in terms of gain and loss and winning and losing and getting rich and being poor and, or we just dismiss it as nonsense. But the Bodhisattva is able, the Sutra is telling us what you as the Bodhisattva can do at this point, at this level. Furthermore, we saw every step he took to get here. It's not by accident. He wasn't picked out by the Buddha as his favorite student. None of that. This is totally public domain. This is creative commons license for you, should you choose to cultivate this path. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let's see, should we do one more? Let's do another pair here. I'm now down to Huo Sui Xin Nian. Okay, that one. I'm gonna do two, okay, we'll do four. Do four, here we go. Huo Sui Xin Nian Yu Yi Shi Jie Zhong Shi Xian Er Shi Jie Zhuang Yan Nai Zhi Bu Ke Shuo Shi Jie Zhuang Yan Huo Yu Yi Shi Jie Zhuang Yan Zhong Shi 或随信念与一毛空实现一切佛庄啊佛境界庄严之事 Okay, there we go. Or should he wish to do so within a single world system, he may make the adornments of two world systems appear, up to and including the features of indescribably many world systems. Or within the adornments of a single world system, he may make appear two world systems, up to and including indescribably many world systems. Or, should he wish to do so, he may make the sentient beings in indescribably many world systems and place them in a single world system. Take sentient beings and place them in a single world system. Or, should he wish to do so, he may take the sentient beings in a single world system and place them in indescribably many world systems. Yet these sentient beings are not disturbed or harmed. Okay, so uh, the Bodhisattva, again, the opportunity arises. He sees that this is what is needed in order to teach the lesson he wants to teach, to help us wake up. And it's not a question of putting big and small and small and big. Here it's living beings and adornments. The adornments of two world systems, the features, the virtues of two world systems up to many and make them different. Okay, what are we talking about? Um, I was mystified by this until when we were 
uh, bowing the 10,000 Buddhas repentance one year at City of 10,000 Buddhas, we got to the section in the text called the Buddha's teaching on names of Buddhas, Sutra. Sutra on the Buddha's, sutra on the Buddha's teaching about Buddha's names. Uh, there's a section where it describes how Buddhas in their progress towards Buddhahood, people in their progress towards Buddhahood, get to a prediction of their future accomplishment, right? This is one of the features. You, uh, somewhere along the road, you meet uh, a wizard in disguise who says, ah, oh, you are that way, I was that way myself. In the future, you will become a Buddha. Your Buddha's name will be, the eon in which you accomplish it will be called, your top disciples, usually there's two, will be named such and such, the adornments, the features of your Buddha world will be this and that, and your lifespan as a Buddha will be this and that, right? Those are usually the topics the prediction covers. And you hear that and you go, ooh, hmm, landmark, right? So my, my transference of merit into that land has now come to fruition and uh, I know where I'm heading. Okay, so the sutra described that. Read, oh, different Buddha's names, different predictions, different worlds, different adornments, different features of the land. Okay, so it was like, ah, uh, now I kind of see what this is about. So Buddha lands, which is now we, when we're done with today's lecture, we're going to transfer merit, right? One of the classic places to transfer merit is to your future Buddha land. Um, May I take this merit and virtue and dedicate it to Buddha's pure lands. Okay? Ah, there it is. That's what we do. So we transfer it out, and there's a time when that land takes on the qualities that we, we sent to it, that we gave to it. Maybe it's, they say the ground is yellow gold. There are pools of the eight waters of merit and virtue. And the bottom of each pool is pure, spread over with golden sand. And on the four sides are stairs of gold, silver, lapis lazuli, and crystal. Above are raised pavilions, adorned with gold, silver, lapis lazuli, crystal, mother of pearl, rubies, and carnelians, right? Etc. Those are all qualities that your world that you're making, you're creating, will reflect because of the goodness that you infused it with every time you transferred merit. Huh, interesting. So these, like these threads start to make fabric now, right? We get these pieces of practice introduced to us by our teacher, and he's not giving us some theoretical class and, you know, Buddha land theory 1.4, you know. No, it's not. He just says, do this now, or he doesn't even say it, you just follow him. And then you go, oh, I see, oh, transfer, oh, merit, uh -huh. adorn, oh, pure, oh. Okay, so should he wish to do so within one world system, he might make the adornments of two world systems appear. So the gold, golden sand and the lapis lazuli trees now come right together, merge, right? And the features of indescribably many world systems or within a single world system, two world systems appear entirely with many worlds. So, got it. Okay, got it. Take the kookaburras from southeastern Queensland and put them in Alameda County. And take the, <laughs> what Alameda County have that we could give? It's, take UC Berkeley and drop it down in Broad Beach. Drop it down in Surfer's Paradise and see what happens. Uh, would, would there be disruption, right? Would the living beings in those places be upset? <sighs> take the surfing, take, take the white sand of the Gold Coast and drop it in San Francisco. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Boy, oh boy. And watch people take selfies. 
Should he wish to do so, he can take the sentient beings in indescribably many world systems and put them in a single world system, or sentient beings in a single world system and put them in indescribably many world systems, and the sentient beings there would not be disturbed or harmed. <laughs> can you see? Taking the surfers from Gold Coast and dropping them onto to, uh, you know, in the financial district in San Francisco, dropping them down in Chinatown, you know what would happen? People would go, uh-huh, right. Or they would, they would take a selfie, but nobody would say anything, you know, that's weird, right? It's just like California, it's just, we're too cool, right? Like, yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. Welcome, there's California's had all kinds of new ideas start here and then filter out to the rest of the country, right? So we want beautiful sand beaches in Cleveland, in Pittsburgh, Dallas. Yeah, yeah. The sentient beings in those world systems are not even like upset as they land in a new world. How does that work? I oh, know, this is like, huh, yeah. Okay, break time. Doot. Time out. What are we gonna look at? We're gonna go back to last week talking about psychic powers as a thing. Hey, where are we? Here we go, five eyes. There it is right there. Station of boundless emptiness, here it is. Last week, we talked about the Luohan uh, Shibabian, the 18 transformations of an arhat in their Mahayana version, which is what it's called, Shen Zhu Wutong, the fulfillment of spiritual accomplishment, maybe, psychic feat, Shen Zhu right? Spirit feet. That, that's the Chinglish translation. And usually there are six. Here there are five. Usually Tian Yan, the Deva I comes first, it comes last. What's missing out of here is Lo Jin Tong, the psychic ability of ending all outflows. Not mentioned here in the Bodhisattva's third stage. This is the third of the ten stages, right? And this is the mother load. This is the, the basic inscription on the rock about psychic powers. From what? From the Bodhisattva's point of view. Now, I, I need to say, probably, right, there are other lists. For example, dragons are said to be able to cultivate shantung, psychic powers. Um, Ashuras, the nemesis, the eternal adversaries of the devas in heaven are said to have psychic powers. So does Lord Chakra, the chief among gods, the deva boss. He's got psychic powers and he uses them to defeat the Ashuras in battle. Another piece of the Avatamska Sutras. Wonderful, wonderful encounter. I mean, come on. We, what are we during quarantine around the world? What was the number one hot item? Was computer games, right? Was games, gaming, gaming consoles. Past those days locked up in your apartment. People just stayed on their gaming consoles. And gaming, right, like computer games, is now a billion, billion, billion dollar industry. Growing up, we didn't play computer games. We went outdoors. We were all in my neighborhood, we were all four sport athletes. Football season just moved right into basketball season and basketball season, we would shovel off, shovel the snow and ice off our driveway so we could play basketball in the snow in the winter. And then the snow melts, it's time for tennis and golf. And then baseball season rolls around. Baseball season goes into football season. And that's what we did every day after school. So the uh, world is different now. And the advent of the microchip, micro circuits, right? And now we can take all that fun and bring it into your console, put it on your laptop, on your phone. So gaming. The inventors of games, people go, wow, that's so amazing. 
you know, how you can get out there and fight like a transformer with the great evil baddies. And we borrow from Japanese manga and animate these creatures. And here we are fighting, you know, these great demons. Okay, cool. And in between was what? Dungeons and Dragons, D&D, back in the 80s, was kind of the, the step in between gaming and the incredible things that we can do with computer games now. And uh, when you look at the Avatamsaka Sutra, you think, all right, I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. One of the, the real contributions of Carl Jung, right, the Swiss psychotherapist, a uh, colleague of Sigmund Freud, and one of the great founders of Western analytic psychology. Jung uh, talked about archetypes in the mind. And his notion was that just by being a human being, raised by parents as a, from childhood to your adulthood, we, each one of us, absorbed the teachings of our culture, of our tribe, of our nation, of our family. So that's all nurture, right? This, this, the lessons of, this is epist we're back to epistemology again, how we know stuff. So we watch our mom react to disappointment or difficulty and we learn how, how adults do it. We watch our dad laugh when something makes, tickles his funny bone, and we, we understand how adults laugh, humor, right? So just by growing up, just by breathing, by going through 24 hours in a human body, these lessons come into us. Jung said, there is also nature in, there's nature and nurture in raising a human to be a participating member of the culture. And what does nature give us? He said these archetypes are built in. They are fundamentally there, keyed in, hardwired language we use now. They're programmed into our consciousness to, uh, for us to respond in certain ways and to aspire to, to certain goals and predictably Predictably, we will react when we get this stimulus. Because why? Well, because mm, the anima and the animus, right? The fundamental maleness, the fundamental femaleness. And okay, so this, these are theories, and people have gone in different directions with the Jungian uh, psychoanalysis. But there's definitely something there. A Jung was looking into the same cupboard or closet that the Buddha opened wide and shone lights on and reported in the sutras, right? So it's, it's wrong to say that, you know, the Buddha confirms Jungian psychoanalysis. That, that's wrong by about 1900 years. <laughs> The Buddha, 2,500 years ago, said, yeah, look, look here. When we go into the mind, we uncover all these things. All these things are there waiting for us. We are indeed, the nature contains these dharmas, these currents, these directions, these gateways, these roads are there. It's kind of like he was giving us a map of the psyche. And he said, I'm gonna give you methods, techniques that I myself practiced in order to create a Buddha, an awakened being. When I woke up, here were the things that I left behind for you to follow if you wanna do what I did. Okay, so how interesting. We've got our Bodhisattva now able to do things. What did we talk about last week? We talked about the uh, the shenzu, right? The, the the perfect spirit, the perfected spirit, the ability to um, 
change his body. We talked about his hearing, the deva ear, tian ar tong. We talked about knowledge of others' thoughts. That's how far we got last week. Knowledge of others' thoughts, you know, is mind reading. Okay, and we read the whole list of, of uh, what the bodhisattva, the kind of thoughts the bodhisattva has. Um, say, say it again. The, the kind of things he sees us think. The sutra gives us a long list of when we have these thoughts, they're known to the bodhisattva. And I was reviewing that today and I thought, I gotta tell my story about Bob Olson. <laughs> I'm gonna, we haven't got, I'm gonna tell a story now. We did a timeout from the sutra. One of my favorite, I have a lot of stories about Bob Olson, Wofa, because Bob Olson was very kind to me when I first got to Gold Mountain Monastery back in 1974 with the plan to leave home. I still had, uh, years of my, my master's program to finish at UC Berkeley. And I had a bunch of student loans that I took from my undergraduate years to repay. I did not want to default and be chased by debts, you know, especially because I was planning to become a monk and leave home. So Bob Olson kindly said, Guo Zhan, he says, here, he says, do you ever hold a, you ever hold a pipe wrench? <laughs> No, Bob, never did. Oh, you ever hold a screwdriver? Well, kind of, you know. All right, you can come and be my electrician's apprentice, he said. And I'm like, really? Cool. I, oh, poor Bob. And he suffered with me because I was not that handy. But over time, with his patience, I did learn a little bit about the trade of being an electrician and how to bend conduit, how to strip Romex, and how to, you know, shoot the wire through around the corner and to do it legally according to the code of San Francisco's electrician's code, right? How to do it right so it worked. So I learned a bit about that. Anyway, Bob was a, one of the early disciples, a hippie, came down from the northwest, Seattle, like many of the, that very first group that drew, new, drew near Master Shenhua. And uh, Bob lived in Gold Mountain as a layman and went out every day to do his electrician's trade. So he was a working layman. So Bob, among other things, had a sweet tooth. He, he loved jelly donuts. That was one of the things that Bob built his world around was jelly donuts. Every day as we went out to, uh, to our electrician's jobs in the city of San Francisco where I was living, now at Gold Mountain, uh, we started the morning by hitting the bakery, the bake shop there in the Mission District. And Bob would get three or four jelly donuts and a six pack of Diet Coke. That's what he drank. So jelly donuts and Diet Coke, breakfast of champions champion monks and monks in training so uh, problem is take away the jelly donuts and Bob had trouble you know he yeah it's, that's the problem is our habits own us as much as we own our habits right so okay so one day it was Sunday as Master Hua did on Sunday he took the residents of Gold Mountain over to our Translation Institute on Washington Street. Washington Street over in Pacific Heights, we had a very lovely big mansion, one of the famous houses in San Francisco, where our nuns lived. And that's where uh, Instilling Virtue, Cultivating Goodness schools began. And we called it uh, Washington Street was the name of the, the building. We called it. That was our ITI, International Translation Institute. And uh, we were getting in the cars, planning to drive across town from the Mission Street, 15th Street, Mission District, over to Pacific Heights. And Master Hua turned around and said, Go fa. He said, you watch the door. Watch it carefully. Anybody who comes looking for me, he says, 
get the information, get their phone number, and we'll call them back. He said, now watch the door, Gofa, don't move. And uh, don't let anybody steal the door. Ha ha kam manko. Biao rang renja toman tolaman. He said. So Bob says, okay. Okay, Sherfu. I'll do it. And uh, just as we left, somebody made an offering for lunch. And what was the offering? It was a box of jelly donuts. Uh, if this were a soap opera, you would hear an organ in the background. <laughs> so, a dozen jelly donuts, the very best, from the bakery there in Mission District, sitting on the counter in the other room, the dining room, on the, the counter where we filed by to get our, our lunch every day. And Bob Olson's job from Sherfu was to sit in the bench by the front door, which is in the other room, and not to leave it, because once he leaves the front door, he's, something might happen, and he wouldn't be able to tell Sherfu what, who came. Okay. We get in the car, drive to Washington Street. We're listening to Sherfu explain a text, all sitting there, you know, meditating, and listening to, the, to Sherfu speak Dharma. And Sherfu stops his lecture, and he says, uh, he says, does that phone reach over here? And uh, so he says, yes, sir, we got a long, long cord. So, you, so they bring the phone over. Shurfu picks up the phone, dials. Hello? What doing? Ah, uh, anybody come? Nobody came? Okay, watch the door hangs up the phone, continues his lecture. <laughs> and we're like, what? What's going on here? So, okay, another half hour passes. Bring the phone over. <laughs> Bring us the phone. Ring. Hello? What doing? Oh, anybody come? No? Okay. Watch the door. <laughs> hang the phone. So we have lunch, get back in the car, and go back to Gold Mountain. And as Master Hua steps into Gold Mountain, here's Bob Olson kneeling in front of Shurfu, ash white, just, just pale sweat. His t-shirt is soaking, dripping wet with sweat. And he bows to Shurfu, and he bows. And Shurfu says, oh, hmm, any news? Anybody come, Gofa? Okay. And what doing, Gofa? And Gofa says, Shurfu, you can read my mind. Shurfu says, of course I can read your mind. How else could I teach you? He says, and goes upstairs. And we're going, what's going on? And so Olson says, he says, I was sitting here. I was doing a good job. I was watching the door. I, had, I was in full lotus. And uh, he says, you know, it's the strangest thing. He says, those jelly donuts in there, they were calling me. They, they were calling me. They were saying, come in, come in and eat. We're here. There's cherries, there's strawberry, there's, you know, yellow, like lemon cream. And when he says they were talking to him, and I, I says, I says, the strangest thing. And I was like, I was saying, no, 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 I can't, I can't. I promise, sure for it. And they, I heard them, they just grabbed my ear and they're pulling me in. And I took my legs down and I was stepping off the bench when the phone rang. And who was it? He says, it was Shurfu. And, 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 he, and as soon as I heard Shurfu's voice, what doing? He says, I just, like, I just, I re, kind of got my, I regained my comment, and I was like, sat back down, and it's like meditating, meditating here, and, and then he says, I just, one of those donuts just tapped me on the shoulder. I could feel it. You know, it's just realist, just like that, you know, and it was, and I put my legs down, and I was, I thought, just one, just one. And I went out, and the phone rang. And what doing, Guofa? And it was like it was Shurfu again. And, and suddenly I realized that I was in the state. Of my desire was just so strong that I was so embarrassed. And I thought, how can I be such a wimp that my own desire manifests 
as, as you know, jelly donuts to pull me into the kitchen. And, and so he says, I realize that I'm just totally a wimp. I need to get, I need to really learn to meditate. I have no samadhi at all. You know? And then Shrivel came in and he says, boy, with a teacher like that, he said, we can actually get somewhere, you know. But I, I got to swear off jelly donuts. <laughs> so that was, that's my, my memory of the, uh, you know, the bodhisattva with his ability to know the thoughts of others. The bodhisattva in that way, with the knowledge of others' thoughts, knows the thoughts of living being. So what's going on? I have no idea, but I saw that happen with my own eyes, right? So Shurfa would teach us with whatever we are attached to. Last week I told the story of my attachment to uh, a five-planet conjunction on the third degree of Sagittarius, my rising sign. That was how I took refuge. So to have a skillful teacher who can actually teach you. What about knowledge of past lives? Su Ming Tong, Su Ming Tong. This Bodhisattva remembers and knows the particulars of limitless past lives. That is, he remembers and knows for, here we go, ready? Here's the list. One life. Remembers and knows for two lives, three lives, four lives, up to 10 lives, 20, 30, and so on, including a hundred lives, limitless hundreds of lives, limitless thousands of lives, limitless hundreds of thousands of lives, for the coming into being of an eon, for the decaying of an eon, for limitless coming into beings and decayings of eons, the Bodhisattva knows, and here's a quote, how I was born in such and such a clan, such and such a race, with food and drink, with lifespan, living where, length of time, suffering and happiness. Having died there, I know how I was reborn in such and such a place. Having died in such and such a place, I was reborn in another place with such and such a body, characteristics, appearance, mode of speech, end quote. In that way, the Bodhisattva can remember and call to mind the limitless particulars of the past. Flower Garland Sutra saying, here is a Bodhisattva's shantong, psychic powers. Don't give me the realtor with his tianyan, his deva eye. I don't want to know about that, right? That's show business. That is a major scam. Here's the real psychic powers. And again, my familiar qualification, qualifier, which is what? It's in you, it's in me. This circuitry, this program is there waiting for us to boot it up, right? To do what the Bodhisattva has done. And what has the Bodhisattva done? He, she was motivated by compassion and practiced the Dharma. This, this is the third stage, right? The Fa Guang Di, the, the, the stage of emitting light. And it describes how um, the priorities of the Bodhisattva are different now. Um, this bodhisattva will do anything to hear the Dharma. He will let go. This says there's nothing he will not, she will not renounce in order to hear one sentence of Dharma that will help him or her purify their bodhisattva practices, meaning get it right. Because they have connected. At this, this is the third stage. And the bodhisattva connects at this point that by learning the Dharma, he can help. By learning the Dharma, she can heal. That's the new priority. And things shift at this point. It's not, oh, I have an appetite that I have to satisfy. I need this before I'm happy, right? Not, it's living beings are suffering because of appetites. I'll try to satisfy them, but the purpose of that is so they get the Dharma, so they can wake up. So with that new priority, the Bodhisattva says, yeah, I'll do anything if I can learn more about how to cultivate and what, what actually hits the spot, right? So many things are dukkha. They don't hit the spot. They don't do it for me. You get it and it's not what you wanted and you get it and it didn't scratch the itch, right? So much is like that. 
Bodhisattva goes, hmm, found something that scratches the itch. And it's understanding itching. Looking at the nature of itching and saying, oh man, there we go. Right? Um, so, because of this ability to know past lives, wow, how detailed. When I grew up, uh, if you, you know, you would go to where? You'd go to see the psychic. It was kind of a joke. She was usually, it was a woman. She was usually depicted as a gypsy, a person of the Ram, you know, this tribe. And they were supposed to be able to know these things. Or it was a witch, or it was uh, somebody's uh, eccentric grandmother, usually, you know. And, or it was, it was uh, uh, you'd get it in a, you'd go into the drugstore, and the drugstore would have like a gumball machine. And you'd put your nickel in or your quarter, and out would come this little plastic thing that you broke it in half, and out comes your fortune. That's, that's what past lives was. And it was always, you were always somebody famous. You were always like, Oh, wow, you were Napoleon in a past life. Or, oh, she was Cleopatra, queen of the Nile. Oh, you were the Roman Emperor Claudius, or you were Beethoven, or you were, you know. It was never, you know, you open the prediction. Oh, you were sold as a slave and died of the plague in the hull of a ship, you know. You were stolen out of your home village and carried across the ocean for somebody else's financial benefit, you know. You were a nameless beetle upside down on a leaf in a rainstorm on the side of a road on the coast of California. No. No. We don't want to know that when our lifetimes as beetles, our lifetimes as, you know, worse than the slave. You were the slave owner who was destined to suffer in the hells for having enslaved a human being. You know, we don't want to know about that. So, your past life was always something noble and wonderful, right? We're gullible, right? We want to know this stuff. So, here's the Bodhisattva saying, I can tell you what I ate for lunch in the lifetime that I was there as a rug merchant in India in this eon, you know. And in this lifetime, I met the Buddha he appeared as a meditator in the park under a tree in the ban- under the bandstand in the civic park in my small town. And we all gathered around and the Buddha opened his eyes and said a couple words and the sound of his voice made me want to become a better person. You know, this, The Bodhisattva can tell you all those stories. And interestingly, interestingly, um, in the chapter to come, the entering the Dharma realm, the Rufa Jepin, chapter 39, the end of our sutra here. Um, when the pilgrim, Sudhana, goes out on his pilgrimage to wake up to become a Buddha, he meets 53 Shanjirsha, Kalyana Mitra, right? And uh, he asks them about their past lives. And many of them, not all, many of them tell him, they say, oh, Good man. Have you made the Bodhi resolve? Yes, I have. Okay, good. I'll tell you. And they, they show their Dharma door. They teach him how to cultivate. And then they have a conversation. He says, yeah, in the past, I was the daughter of a uh, prime minister. And my parents were good people. And they uh, invited the monks in. And the Buddha appeared. And I saw the Buddha and resolved, made the Bodhi resolve on the spot, you know. So they, they know. So here's, you know, could it be? Now, I ask you, we look into DNA, RNA, we, you know, 23 and me, we, we look into genealogy telling us what our racial characteristics are going back lifetimes. Could it be that somehow coded into our, what do you call it, your nature, your mind, we know 
these details about every life. This one just stopped me, right? It says, I know what clan I was born into, what my race was, what I ate and drank, how long I lived, where I lived, and how long I lived there, how much suffering and happiness I had. Where are those uh, Akashic records, right? Where are those marks made on what medium so that now we can, the Bodhisattva, at this point, can go back and see and say, oh, accurately, there it is. There's the record. There are the marks. There's the, the writing on the wall. There's the graffiti that tells my story of that lifetime. But two, three, four, ten, twenty, thirty, hundreds, limitless hundreds, thousands, limitless hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. Not one, but all those, right? And I died, I was reborn, reborn, looked like this, had this abilities, these talk like this, right? How cool. I mean, to think that it's not for nothing, that there is something in us keeping track, right? What this does to... Um, a notion of history, right? People who are historians. According to the sutra, each one of us has recorded way back all this knowledge. That's pretty amazing. So, and yet, what, what it compel, pr compels, what, what it suggests that we do is keep in mind where this comes from, which is a wish to help. The Bodhisattva is not reporting all this to sell books, to be famous, to get rich. Not. He's doing this to help. Right? Because with this knowledge, he is able to say things to us that we might listen to for a change. <laughs> he might have one bit more influence on us so that we change a habit and wake up. Because his awakening is dependent now on our awakening. Right? Okay, I just only stepped into one more. We got one more, the Tianyin. The, that big one, the Deva I, is yet to be explored or explained. Coming up, coming up next week. We keep pushing it ahead. But this is good stuff. I mean, this is just so vital to appreciating. You know, do we appreciate, if we call this Buddhism, it doesn't matter what we call this. This is human lore. This is the teaching, Shifu calls it the teaching of living beings. This is the teaching of humanity. This is the teaching of wisdom, right? And it, it precedes division into male, female, African, Asian, Caucasian, European, Latino, gender, age. Those are all the details. What we're doing now is we're going below those superficial differences to a place, calls it the nature, right? We're shining a flashlight in the basement of our experience as sentient beings, finding out what's stored down there. And if we open up that packing case, what do we find? And how does it work? What is its ti xiang yong? What's it made of? What's it look like? How does it work? And then what do we call it? Right? How cool. So that's why we dig into the Flower Garland Sutra, because all this stuff is, it's available to us, but we don't, if it wasn't for Master Hua, every night of his life in the West, opening the text and saying, you, you can use this. Look what's here. Take some. Here, have some treasures. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't know ourselves. Right? Who's got time to dig into that Flower Garland Sutra? It's all Buddhist philosophy anyway. Nobody understands it. Right? Now I know why. This is good stuff. This is really, really thought-provoking wisdom and compassion. All right. Uh, there we go for now. More next week. 
Uh, California is in trouble. Climate change. I, the headline that I saw as I came over today was California asks for help from Australia and where else? We're requesting help with firefighting. In a time of pandemic, one of the biggest problems is in the fires of 2019, uh, inmate populations were ready-made volunteers to go out and fight fires. Well, quarantine lockdowns prevents that. So the available firefighters are just not there in numbers. Planes could not drop their fire retardant over the Santa Cruz Redwoods because the smoke was too thick. They couldn't see where they were dropping. So you take away the firefighters, take away the helicopters and the planes, and there's no way you can get a fire truck into our gully, you know, our valley. It's too rugged. It burns uncontained. And there's more dry lightning storms on the way between now and Tuesday. So as we, uh, I'm going to, we'll sing the dedication first and then ask for some announcements from the monks at Berkeley Monastery. So the uh, dedication of merit is we're going to do a, we're not going to do the uh, Medicine Buddha mantra t today. We're going to do the the traditional dedication because we we're working with multiple disasters at once. Okay, so please make a wish, however you would like to send out your merit, and we'll put our hearts together. Be sincere. Shoes at the Berkeley Monastery to tell us about our announcements at this point. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Dharma Master. This is Jin Wei. Here I am with Jin Foster. Hi, I'm Ito Fo. So we want to announce uh, that we have uh, quite a few events uh, just this, this coming week, starting on Monday. Yeah. Uh, we will recite a Great Compassion Mantra dedication for those who are suffering from fires. This is kind of our response and wish to, to support people's animals, sentient beings in this difficult and challenging time. So 
you can go to our website, berkeleymonastery.org. And it's Monday, August 24th, from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. And you can join us from YouTube channel. You can join us through Zoom. Uh, if you want to join from Zoom, you, has to, you have to re register. And it's the link there. So this is the first event. And the second is on this coming Saturday, we'll start a week-long Amitabha session, right? It's August 29th to September 4th. And uh, we start our session uh, Saturday, August 29th, with transmission of eight precepts at uh, 8 a.m. California time. And follow the schedule. You can see the schedule. And for seven days. And... Uh, eight precepts. Eight precepts, right, it says. And the first day will be eight precepts. Those of you uh, uh, who are interested, you can uh, register uh, for the Pyways. Fill out, you, have, you need to fill out the form and it's the memorial plaques uh, for two for, for yeah, one person. One person, two, two Pyway. You can find also a link over there. And please hurry up because we have to print it out mm -hmm. them and prepare everything for the session. So don't uh, wait if you can. If you have in mind the person you want to support, please do. Uh, Saturday, September 5th, it will be online Ulambama, Ulambana ceremony uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 a.m. And Sunday, September 6th, the next day, will be the also online Air Store Sutra recitation, right? In Chinese. Yeah, in Chinese, yeah. So, and another, the last one I want to mention that we have this wonderful uh, uh, <coughs> uh, action. This is a six annual Berkeley Interfaith Blood Drive. I want to go to the details. This pretty well explain how you can join and support your communities. You know, you can do around the whole US. You can find by clicking the, you know, the links, interface sl sleep up, blood drive, and you can click pledge to give blood. And when you do it, you can uh, put your zip code, your mail address and your name, and it will direct you to the local uh, American Red Cross. So you can make appointment. And of course you can do in US, but also we can encourage you to, to join this action around the globe. Because especially right now in the pandemic time, and in, here in California, we have the natural disasters, fires, and so on. We really need blood, really need your help. And this is, you know, our kind of interfaith effort. We have friends from uh, different religions, uh, Jew Jewish, Christians, uh, Muslims, and Hindus, you know, at just join our team, the um, Vedanta Society. Uh, so it's another a way how we can cultivate our bodhisattva path. So check it out. Okay, thank you both. Uh, we also, here's uh, Amelia Barilli's class, advertised. Please look into this, workshops for cultivating resistance to the disease. Uh, some techniques that, uh, that uh, Dr. Barilli has uh, been successful with, is she sharing with us? Also, um, Jin, Jin Wei Shi, Jin Fo Shi didn't mention that there's the ongoing daily practices at the Berkeley Monastery are also available here um, to click on and discover. I won't go into the details. Um, they're all available here. Okay. Right, if someone wants, can spend every day almost five hours of cultivation. <laughs> every day. <laughs> You can join our virtual monastery and be part of the community. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay, thank you all for joining. Appreciate very much the efforts of people in California and right here on the Gold Coast to bring this, um, this lecture series uh, online. Um, how many folks on the Chinese channel today? 77. 77. It's growing. My goodness. So we have a hardworking translator, a team of translators here, and 160 on YouTube today. Excellent. Everybody learning about uh, what is the mind capable of? I mean, how could the mind, 
I'm just, I'm boggled by that, the idea that somewhere inside we uh, have inscribed the details of every past life. How is that, and where do we go to find it? And the Bodhisattva's like, yeah, sure, but I'm, mine's not so interesting. Yours is interesting, because I'll, I'll use it to help you wake up, you know, whoa. How about that? Okay, so let's do some bowing. So we can do our three half bows to the Buddha and then three half bows to our teacher. You join me if you care to. Here we go. to the Venerable Master. See you all next week, everyone. Bye-bye. Omitofo.